And just to uh, briefly introduce our um, speaker for today, we have Rob Fauché, who, you know, I can't do the whole thing because he will be, uh, you know, lots and lots of stuff, but, you know, real expert, instructional design, human performance technology, author of textbooks, uh, wide performance in the field of uh, various companies, uh, and working with uh, uh, Hale Associates, Judy Hale, who was one of our speakers uh, a few months back, and also uh, teaches at its University of North Texas, I think, and Walden University. Um, so he's a very busy person, but we're really excited to have him talk today about critical thinking, which I think is a wonderful subject for us to uh, be, we, be tackling today. So Rob, um, if you're ready, um, go ahead. We have a few people sure. joining and, and welcome to all of you, but Rob, okay. just take it away. All righty, let's see if we can get my... Uh... Uh, I'll switch over to, okay, anyway, good, all righty, great. Um, well, let me talk a little bit about uh, how I got started in this, with this topic. Um, the, um, uh, um, uh, some time ago, it dawned on me that the most important things we could be training people on had to do with the subject of critical thinking and uh, or the, uh, which also include, uh, which also a closely related topic is complex ill-structured problem solving. That's a piece of psychological jargon. But the point here is that lots of times in training, we spend our time on uh, road procedures and facts and Mm. policies and compliance training and so on and so forth. And um, that's all stuff that pays the bills and it has to be done and so on, but it's not what adds value to the company. And what adds value to the company are people that know how to, that know how to think well and know how to solve problems and know how to uh, uh, think critically. And so that's really what, what it is that, uh, that I got interested in uh, early in my career. And, um, uh, and, and it turned out to be as uh, uh, during that period, the cognitive science underlying all this was just happening. It was just breaking, flowering open and all kinds of groundbreaking, ground, groundbreaking uh, experiences took place uh, or uh, took place starting, starting then and continuing really over the next 20 odd years or so. So what I'd like to do is to, um, is to talk specifically about the problem of, of uh, critical thinking. Uh, and how you and, and how it is we approach it and what it is we do. So I'm, we're, we're going to talk about these four topics. What is critical thinking? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the role of uh, domain knowledge versus beliefs. And the answer is it's not what you think. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about misconceptions simply because that is an important topic that it has it requires its own special treatment and it's something we deal with all the time. And then we'll get into uh, uh, some of the general, general generalities for teaching uh, critical thinking. Unfortunately, um, we are not going to be able to get into examples as much as I would like, uh, uh, given this given this content. But we will have discussion afterward and and during, and I'd be more than happy to talk about examples and more stories as much as as much as you'd like. So let's take a look first of all at what critical thinking is. Um, uh, uh, there are a number of pieces to it. Uh, one piece has to do with uh, 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 formal logic, if you will, uh, the formal logic piece, which is uh, 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 which underlies all this. People don't think about that very uh, a lot. Um, there are uh, beliefs about critical thinking that it's important that you need to uh, you need to skeptically examine. Um, claims that people make uh, and so on. But then there are also skills uh, having to do with uh, scientific argumentation, it's often called. And, um, uh, and, and that's what we're gonna spend most of our time talking about today. Uh, and then uh, cutting through all of that is domain knowledge. And the generality about domain knowledge is that's, that's what you know about the world or some piece of the world. Uh, and how it's organized and how it works uh, and so on. And the important thing to keep in mind 
uh, for trainers is that you can cause damage. If you teach domain knowledge the wrong way, then you can actually prevent people. It's been shown experimentally. You can actually prevent people from doing critical thinking or doing complex problem solving uh, with their domain knowledge. And so that, that's, a, that's a real important kind of consideration. Uh, what are the benefits of critical thinking? There are really three of them. Um, first of all, you learn to challenge beliefs versus just uh, doing summaries. Uh, uh, and you know, that's a critical, uh, you know, lots of times if you take a look at a, uh, 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 a uh, anything, a textbook, a, um, a newspaper article, a speech, and so on, all they're really doing is summarizing. They're not really... Mm -hmm saying this is why you should believe what, uh, what I'm or why, why you should take this claim seriously. What they're doing is just summarizing uncritically. Uh, and there's a big difference between the two. Kids coming out of school and adults therefore oftentimes only know how to summarize. Um, if you engage in critical thinking, then you will be able to spot and correct misconceptions, which are all over the place and quite common and cause all kinds of problems. That's what Will Rogers was talking about in that opening slide. Yeah. And this is the foundation for innovation at every level of the organization. It used to be with hierarchical thinking about organizations, the idea was that innovation only occurred at the top and therefore the people that needed to do critical thinking were only the senior executives. That flat is not true. If it ever was true uh, in organizations, it certainly isn't true now. Uh, this kind of critical thinking exists at every level of the organization. Uh, this has been found repeatedly in um, manufacturing, in uh, all kinds of businesses, in military, uh, and so on. It has caused a fun, uh, we can get into lots and lots of war stories of examples of this um, if, uh, if you want to. Uh, it's revolutionized the way that um, um, medical training is done, for example. So let's talk a little bit about domain knowledge then and what it is. Well, the basic issue here is it's not just what you know, it's how it's put together, how it's organized. So here's some examples of domain knowledge versus a belief. A domain knowledge is supported by evidence. That is to say, you know what evidence there is that's, that shows you that, that this component of your domain knowledge is actually true. Um, beliefs, on the other hand, are accepted as true. Domain knowledge is confirmed by observation. Beliefs are confirmed, uh, are received from an authority figure, an influencer, uh, and the like. Domain knowledge, you test by prediction, by trial, and by explanation. If you can do those things, with domain knowledge, then you have a reason to believe it's true. Uh, belief, on the other hand, is tested by direct personal experience. This is a critical distinction, direct personal experience. If you listen carefully to the people who, uh, who for example, who don't have, don't, uh, uh, who don't believe in vaccination, what they will talk about is their direct personal experience. What has happened to them, what has happened to their family members, what has happened to their associates at work and so on. And all of the rational arguments that you see coming from the CDC and so on about, you know, this is what the data says and so on and so forth are simply irrelevant. It's not the people and, and not believable, therefore. Domain knowledge is validated by replication, preferably done by others. The whole idea of domain knowledge is that I should be able to confirm it by replication. You should be able to confirm it by replication and so on. And we should come up with the same conclusions, the same, uh, the same idea of what it is. Beliefs, on the other hand, are validated by consistency with other beliefs. In other words, if this claim uh, fits in with everything else I think I know, with my other beliefs, then it must be true, and so on. Some examples. The distinction between climate and weather. Climate is an abstraction. 
You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. There is no personal experience of climate. It moves slowly. Weather, on the other hand, changes day to day. It is direct personal experience. People talk about it all the time. And that's why it is that people can say, uh, will say things like, it's really cold today. Where's global warming when we need it? There's a distinction between doing science and believing scientists. If, if you have a belief system and you're, uh, then you may, and your influencers include scientists, which they may or may not, they may include movie stars or politicians or whatever, then that's, um, uh, that's who you're going to believe. Uh, that's different from doing the science yourself or engaging in the process or reading, reading the, uh, you know, reading the evidence or whatever. It, it, and, and Rob, it just you, with something you just mentioned, which was so interesting to me, is it, we've had this uh, burgeoning, uh, I don't know if it's a job or whatever, <laughs> of influencers, right? I mean, and that's, yeah. they're, they're working on the right-hand side of this, right? Absolutely correct, yeah. Look closely at, uh, there has been some change in, in, in uh, for example, in, vaccina in, the, in, the whole, in the vaccination campaigns. They started out, with um, Anthony Fauci and the you know the CDC experts and so on and so forth talking about the science and the evidence and so on and so forth, and somebody finally got to him and said, "That's fine, but the people you're trying you're trying to get to just don't pay attention to that. It's mean it's meaningless to them. It's not that they don't believe it; it's just meaningless to them. What they believe are their whatever influencers they buy into. So that's when it is that you got movie stars and rock stars and so on and so forth endorsing." Uh, uh, vaccinations publicly. That's why that happened, specifically why that happened. Now, there's another point to make here. Building domain knowledge is terribly, is a lot of work. It's very inefficient. It takes a long time. If we had to do that for everything we know, uh, you'd never get anything done. So we all carry around belief systems. We all carry around things that we have learned from uh, you know, from authorities that are influencers, experts, par our parents, uh, our friends, and so on and so forth. In point of fact, the research on public opinion suggests that that's the way most people um, uh, decide things most of the time. That is to say, you don't start out by saying, "Hmm, what's the evidence on this? I'm going to critically evaluate this." You start out by saying, "Who do I know whose opinion I respect on this, and what do they think about it?" That's the difference between designing a bridge and crossing a bridge. Suppose you had to examine the evidence supporting the design of a bridge before you ever crossed one. So beliefs are very important. They make life livable. Uh, everybody has belief systems and so on. You have to recognize them, but you have to recognize that they're formed in a different way from domain knowledge. Okay, here's another common one. Domain knowledge is built on things like selling the customer what they want and what they need. And of course, those are different things. Beliefs are based on selling the customer what you want. You know, you think you know better than the customer. You have all kinds of beliefs about the customer and you never test them. And you get those, where do you get those beliefs from? You get them from your top salesman or whatever or your experts in the company, or your CEO, or you know, you know, whatever the culture of your company is, and so on. And that, of course, can lead to some, some hilariously egregious errors. Okay, so let's, let's just talk for a minute here, uh, open up your chat, and uh, tell me just very briefly, what, what is the core domain knowledge of your organization, or the, uh, and what are the core beliefs of your organization? Well, let me start off with uh, an example from uh, where I used to work at American Honda. Uh, you know, you know, this is a company that's uh, built by engineers and, and uh, managed by engineers and stuff. In a lot of cases, um, you would you would get this either spoken or unspoken attitude that um, uh, if it's not designed here, it's not as good as it could be, or you know, we could do it better than somebody else. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's not true. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, you bet. That's a great, that's a great example. Uh, that kind of self-reference, self-referencing gets, get, uh, gets to be very common. Also, I'll um, piggyback on that because I am an engineer. Um, <laughs> um, also, there's a belief among engineers that engineers know how to do everything, which is absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there's a pretty common belief that's circulating in the world today because of uh, remote work that um, managers seem to be disposed to believe that they have to see people working in order to ensure that they're working. Mm. And data suggests that's not mostly true. Yeah, yeah, great example. There's a pretty good chance that whatever the belief system of your CEO is, is, is baked into the uh, belief system of your company. And uh, 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 that can be either, that sometimes that's functional, sometimes it's very dysfunctional. But boy, changing it is damn near impossible. Yep. Uh, unless you change the CEO, and even then, organizations there's a tremendous amount of inertia surrounding all this, and so on. So yeah, uh, you know, so, so th this is the kind of stuff that we need to think about all the time. And the point here is that um, uh, you need to think both in terms of belief systems and in terms of. Um, of uh, formally constructed domain knowledge and you need, need to be able to think carefully. So let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, what can go wrong with domain knowledge. Um, uh, this got, the uh, uh, um, uh, psychologist that would refer to this as debugging the domain knowledge structure um, and so on. And the fundamental insight here is that many, if perhaps most errors are caused, in other words, they're not random, they're not guesses, they're not careless, they're not due to gaps in knowledge or skill. They are due to misconceptions. What's a misconception? Something that you think you know that mm -hmm. isn't true. Yep. Okay, now, do you see already the training implications here? If it's not a gap in knowledge or skill, training will not fix it or training to, to fill in the gap, because it's not a gap. Yep. It's a misconception. People, I know something and it just happens not to be true. That is critical. And this has been demonstrated in a wide range of fields in many professions and trades. So on, here's a simple example, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite ones. My daughters are now in their forties, but when my oldest daughter was, was about three, she brought a balloon to me and she asked me to blow it up. So I blew it up. Tied, her, tied it off, handed it back to her. And she looked at it and then she handed it back to me and said, oh, well, tie a string on it so it will go up. Now yeah. think for a second. Yeah. That was a brilliant inference on her part. It was completely consistent with the data that she had. Right. She had never seen a balloon go up that did not have a string. And she'd never seen a balloon that had a string that did not go up, right? Therefore, she would. It makes a lot, a lot more sense than the real explanation, the one you learned in school. So, you know, that's an example of a misconception. Um, so, once again, a misconception is knowledge. It's not the absence of knowledge. You can have them both for conceptual knowledge and procedural knowledge. Um, uh, 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 they are formed when you try to make sense out of prior knowledge and especially personal experience, which people do all the time. That's what humans do. They try to make sense out of things. Yep. Um, formulate concepts or abstract categories or personal narratives, either one, uh, and can be the source of that. Another, another example this is also from my daughter, just real quickly. Um, uh, same age. And so on. And she, wa she would go around all the time saying, uh, gee, uh, you know, girls have, uh, girls have long hair, boys have short hair, girls wear skirts, boys wear pants, etc." Well, one time I happened to have a colleague over who uh, was male, he had a beard, he had long hair, and he had an earring. And she came over and she looked up at him and she walked around and around and around 
then she came over to me and said, sometimes men have long hair too. (laughs) There is a clue there about how you fix a misconception. You present a negative example. A, a, uh, one that challenges the concept, uh, challenges the concept of the category. Okay, so it's a flaw, and there are two kinds of flaws. There's overgeneralization and undergeneralization, and um, uh, and so on. And we'll we can get into details of all that if you want. You can cause a misconception in your training very easily. All you have to do is to teach with just a definition and no examples. <laughs> that will that will reliably cause misconceptions mm-hmm. over uh, over generalization. You can only use what, if you use only one positive example that will cause over generalization. If you don't bother discussing contrasts and inferences and implications and why, taking the time to do all that reflection work and so on, then people don't uh, uh, don't successfully um, integrate the knowledge into a network correctly. Um, if you teach each topic in isolation without relating it to prior knowledge and without relating it to personal or work experience, that'll do it. <clears throat> Just, you know, simple example. Uh, uh, the uh, 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 for, you know, you know, simple example, one time I was working uh, for uh, uh, developing a uh, maintenance course for Lufthansa Airlines for uh, it's an introductory maintenance course. And the, uh, the plane that they used was, was uh, the original 727, 727-200 and, um, uh, and so on. And um, uh, there are by standard, by fiat, there are, if I remember correctly, 15 systems in an aircraft. Each one had a, each one had a, had a binder and each system was taught separately. Guess what? The trainees had a terrible time coping with problems, malfunctions, troubleshooting, anything uh, that had to do with the interaction of two systems. Because the systems were taught in isolation. Also, if you don't explain how the knowledge is used in practice, once again, you don't link it back to, to actual practice, then you don't, uh, then you, uh, uh, then you, uh, yeah, you will cause misconceptions. And yeah. if you don't allow time for reflection, that will cause misconceptions. Yeah. So we're running a little short on time. Um, but, uh, uh, so let's, let's, let's doing this, uh, let, let's, I'm going to violate my own rule and, uh, uh, we can save the discussion of examples and misconceptions to the end because of their, their tremendous war stories. Okay, so what do you do? How do you correct a misconception? It takes a lot of work is the answer. Um, uh, You have to identify the misconception, call it out as a misconception. But do it, don't do it hostily. Don't say, aha, you idiot. Just say, you're not dumb. You made, uh, you know, the implicit message is you made sense out of what you were learning, but you just were misplaced with your creativity about it. You want to set up cognitive conflict. If it's true, how could this other thing be true? Those are the role of negative examples. Uh, get peers involved in troubleshooting uh, their own and peer misconceptions. If you're in a course, this leads to very deep, rich discussions. Don't say, aha, you do, the, your answer is wrong. Turn it over to the class or the group and say, and say okay, why did he say that? He wasn't intentionally making a mistake. Why did he say that? And that will get them to examine their own knowledge structures and to point out what the misconceptions were. And chances are you will discover all kinds of people had that misconception. And furthermore, there's a pretty good chance, incidentally, that you caused that misconception because you screwed up the way you taught something earlier. And then you can ask for explanations and examples of the correct way to do it uh and get what that does that kind of discussion is very rich it gets everyone to uh and then you know you summarize by saying okay what have you learned what's what's different what changed about the way you understand your work now and so on and that is all about questions that use deep understanding to answer not recall not just recall 
So let's talk a little bit about argumentation and what that is. Um, okay, it's very easy. If you're talking about beliefs, it's very easy. You start out with a claim and you just say, I know it's true because it fits in my belief system, et cetera, all that stuff. What about this? What about this way, doing the scientific argumentation route and so on? The next question you ask is, how do you know that? And then you examine uh, both confirming and disconfirming evidence. If you ever see an argument that does not do that, it's not a scientific argument and you can reject it out of hand. Yeah. Uh, then you weigh the confirming and disconfirming evidence. And uh, you ask yourself, how much should I believe this claim? And on the basis of that, whoops, on the basis of that, then you come out with an answer. And the answer almost inevitably is going to be not this claim is absolutely true or absolutely false. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, well, okay, it's probably true here, but it's not true there. And I'm really not sure about this, but I really am sure about that. And so on and so forth. This drives the media nuts. They can't deal with that. Yeah. And they, that's how why it is you, you see the media accusing the scientists at CDC and elsewhere of constantly changing their mind and shifting and being inconsistent with each other and lying to them, lying to the media and so on and so forth. What's going on is the scientists are used to talking this way. And they're used to saying, well, the you know, preponderance of evidence goes this way, but then there's this disconfirming evidence over there. And the, and, the, and, 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 you know, and the frustration is, why the hell can't you just give me a straight answer? Okay, simple example. I don't know, you know there are, I see a lot of gray hair on the, on the uh, uh, so, so you probably do remember the Edsel. Oh yeah. Right, okay. Uh, one, of the cla one of the most legendary failures in, in Detroit. Okay, so there, was, there were, the confirming evidence was that for a generation, successful cars have been made bigger with more chrome. So they made the biggest car with the most chrome. The disconfirming evidence was that small imports were gaining market share among baby boomers. And the belief system was, we know our customer, we know our market. And on the basis of that, nobody challenged the decision to make the Etzel. And it turned out to be a terribly badly timed decision cost forward an awful lot of money. Okay, let's talk very briefly how are we doing on time by the way we're good we're at about 2 30 uh, 12 30 rather and uh we've got about 15 minutes uh, okay good all right go. so we will breeze through this and then we can uh, discuss as much as anybody wants uh good. and so on okay so um let's go back let me go back here uh okay we're going to talk a little bit about what to teach and then we'll talk about uh how to uh how to do the presentation using these five principles Okay, so the first principle is help, bid, help build heuristics. This is the what to teach part. What's a heuristic? An inductive strategy to build mental models. So you model this in your courses, in your teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't say, here's the mental model. You say, shut up and listen. What you say is, we're going to build a mental model together. You're going to guide your trainees to define the goal and then, uh, and, then, uh, and then the intermediate goals that will get them there. So it's their quest, not, not just you setting the objective, setting, saying, saying, setting the assignment. Um, work from novice mental models to expert ones. Novice models are, um, are simpler. Uh, they, have, they, don't, they lack some of the subtlety. And so an expert's ones have, are much more elaborated. We can talk about that as much as you want. Um, uh, uh, for moderately structured problems, these are problems, moderately structured problems are problems that have more than one way to solve them, but they do have a clear answer. Uh, the, uh, you can scaffold in, uh, the invention of strategies. In other words, how are you going to solve this? What are the different ways? Let me, let's talk a little bit about ways of solving this, uh, solving this problem and allow for many right answers. And you make that discussion the, the, the focus of the class. And then for ill-structured problems, these are the problems where there are multiple right answers uh, or the right answer is unknown. And maybe, uh, uh, and, and most of solving the problem is figuring out the properties of a right answer. Um, uh, in that case, then you can scaffold definition of, uh, of what the goal is. 
and so on. Okay, so how do you support reflection? Once again, we already talked about this one. Take an error. When a student makes an error, don't say that was a dumb answer. Don't say that's wrong. Say, why did you say that? Let's explore what misconception caused you to say that. Ask why questions about strategy. Why did you do it that way? And again, get everybody else involved. Practice across multiple contexts using the same strategy. In other words, don't uh, say, so here's one place where you can use this strategy. Here's another one. And then ask, what do these two have in common? That's how you get a generalizable uh, strategy. And then you call attention to that generalizable strategy. Um, and you can consider discovery teaching strategies as an option, but that's very slippery. Uh, uh, there's there's a, a great deal of research on when to do this and how to do it and when not to do it and how not to do it. And it is simply not true that inquiry learning or discovery learning is produces better learning. Mm -hmm. It is simply not true generally. It is true in specific circumstances. Uh, 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 and then, and another piece of this is don't give your judgment right away. Withhold as the instructor, you're the authority figure. Hold off when, it's, when, a, when, when one of your trainees gives an answer, hold off and just and, and start asking your why questions and said, allow, uh, allow time for reflection on it and so on. And then and only then jump in with the right answer uh, with, with your corrective feedback if necessary. There are some special considerations with all this. How do you build a mental model? Well, you do it by discussing relationships and explanations, not by memorization of facts and procedures. You can look up a fact, you can look up a procedure, yep. but that's the beginning of problem solving. That's not the end of problem solving. Okay, I, there, one little war story. Uh, that I that I uh, a student of mine taught me. I had one student one time, uh, a doctoral student, who subsequently went on. Uh, he, his his field was experimental psychology. He subsequently went on to work for Boeing. He was a pilot, and Boeing trained him as a test pilot. So as far as I know, he was the only PhD experimental psychologist test pilot that Boeing had in captivity. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, he started out doing on uh, uh, doing uh, uh, working on the issue of combat training for pilots. And at that point, this is back in the 1980s, at that point, there was a big difference between the way combat training uh, pilots were trained by the NATO countries and the way the Russians were trained. The Russians were trained procedurally, memorize the facts and procedures and follow those procedures. The, um, uh, the NATO trained pilots were trained to think strategically. They said, okay, you've got an automated cockpit. This plane will fly itself. Let the plane fly itself. You think about what you're gonna do next, what your strategy is. And oh, by the way, you have another piece of critical evidence. We can teach you the procedures that the Russian pilots have been taught and you can predict how they're gonna behave because they're gonna follow those strategy, those procedures. And then you can do something they can't cope with that they don't have a procedure for. And that all came to a head, by the way, in the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, when the American trained pilots just plastered the Russian trained pilots. And it was all done by, you know, these weren't Americans shooting down Russians. These were uh, Saudis shooting down you know, shooting down Iraqis or whatever, but it was American trained pilots versus Russian trained pilots and so on. And the Russians took a look at that and said, oh, shit. And it, and it invalidated uh, uh, incontrovertibly their knowledge or their understanding of how pilots ought to be trained. Incidentally, by the way, the philosophy of uh, training by way of facts and procedures still persists in a pilot training in commercial airlines worldwide. With, and there are some big differences between countries and how pilots are trained that way. That's a whole separate discussion. Um, anyway, simulate, use simulations, games, projects, they're great. 
but use construct around them a dialogue to focus on the problem solving reasoning, not just the solution. It's quite possible to build a game or a, or a simulation that teaches the wrong stuff. If all it does is focus on getting is focus on getting the right answer and not the why, not the reflection, then you've uh, then you're missing the point. Um, uh, 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 the kind of coaching involved here is what's often called caused cognitive coaching, collaborative learning, mental model talking about mental model structure, talking about problem solving reasoning, and so on. That's the kind of dialogue that needs to go on in however you're doing this. Um, uh, how do you focus? How do you do all this in a lesson? Here's a five-part framework that uh, actually I pulled out of the textbook that I wrote. Uh, so what do you do? First step: select. You direct attention to the purpose of the lesson. I'm just going to blast through this real quickly. You establish a motivation theme. In other words, what's in it for me? Uh, you establish uh, uh, you can do it or confidence. So this is something you know, you can figure out how to do. You link to related declarative knowledge. Uh, you relate it to a mental model they already have, uh, and so on. Um, uh, you organize the information, and you present the structure of the content. It is just as important to talk about the structure of the knowledge as it is to talk about the little individual facts. And that's why diagrams are real handy. Worked examples are real handy because that's what they do. Um, state the purpose of learning of the, uh, of the lesson. Use, using plain language, by the way, not objectives. Objectives are jargon for instructional designers. Um, you, uh, then you work on assimilation. So assimilate the new knowledge by connecting to what they already know. This is the reflection piece. Uh, present the new knowledge showing your, uh, 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 emphasize the heuristics and principles. Used worked examples. They are very powerful. Uh, this, by the way, is the flaw in discovery learning. They don't use work. To, discovery learning typically does not use worked examples. They're very powerful. And, and, and can be used to model this. Uh, then you can move, move from simple to complex or from novice to expert uh, and so on. And then you practice, you strengthen uh, with a range of similar problems uh, that get wider, the range gets wider and wider, more, more and more difficult as you go. Um, uh, if necessary, you can go from part task to whole task. Uh, there are some specific considerations about how to do that well or how to do it badly. Um, uh, scaffolded practice, and then gradually you remove the scaffolding. We can talk a lot about what scaffolding means. Um, one thing not to do is don't denature the problem. One common mistake that instructors make is to take something, a, 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 a problem that requires conceptual reasoning, uh, inductive reasoning, and when the, when the learners can't do it, then what they do is to substitute a rote procedure to solve the problem. What that does is to short circuit the reasoning process. It guarantees the learners will never learn the underlying principle. This is one way you can cause damage. If you teach that way, you will reliably, and again, it's been demonstrated experimentally, you will reliably prevent the learner from ever learning the right way to do it. Uh, and again, simple to complex, novice to expert, unusual uh, to unusual problems or wicked problems or misleading problems and the like. Um, vary the context you, uh, uh, as you go. And once again, when errors occur, they are opportunities for learning. Use them. They are rich opportunities for learning. Yep. Uh, another point is learning is not linear. The progress will be spiral. In, and, uh, and, and expect that and provide feedback accordingly. Uh, this, by the way, is the flaw of the fallacy of mastery learning as usually presented. Um, the, uh, and then summary, your summaries should be summaries of the structure of the content. Uh, and you assess using performance-based strategies and we can talk about that as much as you want to. So very quickly, that gets us in, I think gets us in our time limit it does. Um, yeah. All astonishingly enough. So, so I hope this stimulated some questions and some comments, and then we can go back and drop in some examples, some war stories. Um, this is this is. Uh, 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 I hope I hope this this got you thinking. It is 
Pretty still here. I noticed some really interesting comments in chat there. Did you want to elaborate? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, which comments? <laughs> well, you put some in chat, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, about, well, like the diversity of teams, even with, even with the oh, content. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, domain knowledge, um, you know, domain knowledge can be limited by the domain that people know about. So if you mm -hmm. have diverse people on your team that can expand your domain knowledge. And yep. also um, I think bias can play into domain knowledge uh, because mm -hmm. people tend to seek out facts that support their beliefs, even in the domain knowledge arena. Absolutely. Um, and then groupthink can also be in domain knowledge um, like I've seen some studies where um, if everyone went to the same school, obviously the domain that they learned in school is the same. And if you have a variety of schools and things that can cause an increase in uh, what is in the domain. Yep. And then finally, I, since my uh, practice is in engineering, I've been trying to bring in psychological safety because you talked about speaking up. Well, most work cultures, especially if you're at the bottom, it's not safe to speak up. And that has caused most of the failures. Like when we go back to Challenger and all the failures you learn about in business school are really part of psychological safety. So if we don't have psychological safety, we can't do safety or ethics or mentoring or diversity, equity and inclusion properly if we don't have psychological safety. That's a great point. Um, and once again, that goes down that oftentimes that goes down to the idea of the, what are the core beliefs of the company and the core beliefs are oftentimes the core beliefs of the CEO uh, or whoever's in charge. And that can be quite intimidating uh, in many companies. There, you, know, it, you know, the norm of the company can be you do not challenge those core beliefs. That's often the case. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And of course, that will predictably lead to uh, certain kinds of errors. So when I when I was a professor, Rob, uh, I used to um, have to teach clinical graduate students about research methods, and I would ask the I create an example of uh, fifty patients have severe credible depression. They go to Dr. Freud for six months, and at the end of the six months, they have no depression. Did Dr. Freud cure them? And mm -hmm. People with, or you know, would you go to Dr. Freud if you were depressed? And most people would initially say, "Yes, uh, I'm going to Dr. Freud." Uh, then I said, "Well, what if I? What if you had a control group that said um, that they didn't get Dr. Freud, they didn't get any treatment, and I told you they got better in four months? Would you still go to Dr. Freud?" And that causes a conversation to happen to expand their their thinking. So the little rule of thumb that I used to give to people, because they're not going to remember this level of rules, uh, is I would say, can you at least try to think of an alternative interpretation for what you believe? And mm -hmm. we kind of do a cognitive, a mental um, uh, control group, as it were. Uh, you still may be wrong, but uh, it's better than no, no contrast. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, uh, that that that's a great point. Alternative explanations, uh, once again, disconfirming evidence. You have, you know, that's a discipline. You have to build that discipline. You know, you start out by saying, "Aha, here's a study that confirms my beliefs," uh, and so on, and therefore it must be true. And if you stop looking right there, then uh, then you step into uh, all kinds of problems yep. of this which you identified. So you have to have the discipline to say, "Okay, what else? What other evidence is there that's out there?" And is there disconfirming evidence? And oh, by the way, how strong is that evidence uh, in both cases, in all of those cases? And then you make your decision. And um, uh, that, that's, that's a lot of what scientific reasoning is all about. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, doctors don't know it either. But again, doctors are often, uh, are, uh, are, are often trained procedurally. Uh, uh, they, uh, they, that is to say, um, they learn, um, uh, they learn nothing but mountains of facts 
and they learn procedures. If the patient has these symptoms, then you then it's called the diagnosis is this and this is how you respond. And they and what they learn is a few hundred of those, and uh, 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 and so on. And if they encounter something that doesn't fit that model, uh, they're not going to do nothing. They're not going to say I don't know, at least not initially. What they will do is to make a match, make the closest match they can to want to a procedure they do know, and that will lead to a misdiagnosis. Right. Happens all the time. And uh, only later on, typically rule of thumb used to be after about 10 years of medical practice, you will have encountered enough negative examples to be a little humble about the limits, limits <laughs> of your own knowledge. And you will also hopefully uh, be thinking a little bit about the why questions, how my knowledge fits, all, uh, fits together. Uh, and that doesn't happen right away. It doesn't even, it begins to happen in residency if the residency is well constructed um, and, uh, and so on. But again, the rule of thumb used to be, used to be you have to be in practice for about 10 years uh, uh, before you see it. Um, corollary of that, by the way, there is no such thing as a generally good diagnostician. Yeah. Uh, uh, diagnos diagnosticians are good with the, with the patient base that they have that they are experienced with. Uh, so you take a doctor who, uh, whose, whose clinical experience is in the United States, uh, uh, in, su in the suburbs, you drop him in the middle of Africa and he's a terrible diagnostician. Right. And again, that's been demonstrated repeatedly. I have a question, Rob. You mentioned earlier about correcting misperception is hard, and you went through several examples of that and processes mm -hmm. and everything. I would be curious. It's not doesn't directly relate to our topic today. Well, the way it does, but we have in our culture right now a large number of people with serious misperceptions about the current vaccinations and their safety mm -hmm. and efficacy and everything like that. Any thoughts you had on that in terms of correcting that misperception? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a, a few things to believe, uh, a, a, few, a few points about that. First of all, once again, the perception is not based, uh, the beliefs, the, the anti-vax beliefs are not based, are, are based on a belief system. They are not based on scientific evidence. Yeah. Therefore, if you try to provide a scientifically based rational argument, you will be perceived as irrelevant. You might as well be speaking Martian. You what what you have to do is to say, yeah, you know, I understand that that's what you believe, but did you realize that your family member just died of this uh, because they didn't get the vaccination, or your favorite movie star, your favorite sports figure, or you know, or, or whatever, uh, yeah. um, uh, or your favorite politician, or you know, you know what uh, you know whatever again. What you have to do is to challenge them with evidence that, uh, 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 that with their beliefs. So you challenge their belief systems, and you do it by 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 uh, by looking at or by appealing to um, influencers that are going to be meaningful to them. So now you, you know that's why it is we were watching the football game and we saw uh, on this weekend and we saw pro vaccine ads delivered by football players. And uh, star football players, and uh, and so on. So that you know, that's the way that that that's how that's how you, that's that's how you get around that. The other thing you can do with any misconception is to present a uh, a, a negative example, a disconfirming example. Uh, mm -hmm. But once again, the issue there, uh, and that will work if the example is within the personal experience of the person's beliefs. In other words, it has to be a family member, it has to be somebody they personally know, uh, somebody, a family member, a colleague, a coworker, and so on. Uh, you know, I had a, um, uh, I happened to be a ham radio operator. I had a, uh, over last weekend, uh, a friend of mine, or over Thanksgiving, uh, another ham radio operator, friend of mine, who has ham friends all over the world, because that's what hams do, and uh, so on. And he told me uh, over Thanksgiving weekend, he told me he just had, that week, he just had five hams that he, friends of his, die from COVID. None of them were, all of them were anti-vaxxers. Wow. And it was meaningful to him because he knew these people. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I had a comment. Um, I was just thinking about my education experience um, because engineers are trained in critical thinking and um, most of our exams were short answer. So it was just as important how we got to the answer as it was what the mm -hmm. answer was. So yeah. we really didn't have that many multiple choice and you would get partial credit if your thinking was in the right manner. So, mm -hmm. you know, our, even when I took my licensing exam, half the test was short answer. So as we move to multiple choice, you don't really know if that person even knows how to get that answer or if that's they a mis that's a mis that's a, a, a partial misconception. Okay. You can test reasoning with multiple choice questions. You can write questions like that. It's damned hard. Yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, just thinking kind of of my own experience, how we were kind of taught and there wasn't like a right way to do it. It was just, you know, they were testing our thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Engineering thinking is its own variant of, uh, of scientific thinking. Uh, and, and it has to do with, uh, the the way and what what the properties of an of a, of a solution are, and how it is you get there, and what the requirements are, and so on. And and engineers have different ways of judging risk, and so on and so forth. And um, so yes, absolutely true. Uh, and uh, 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 there are two kinds of egregiously bad teaching that I've seen in it uh, in engineering, and and for that matter in math too, uh, uh, which uh, often lies at one underlies at one. Um, is to say, oh, okay, here's a problem. And they take a problem out of the textbook, whatever, and go up to the whiteboard and they write out the answer and say, see? And there's no discussion at all of the underlying reasoning. And what that, what, that's not a worked example because, or more accurately, it's not a fully, wor a fully elaborated worked, worked example. Yep. Um, it, uh, 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 and the, that leaves the learners uh, with the task of attempting to just memorize that as a model, as a model answer, and then hopefully they can generalize from it. But if they do it, they do it on their, under their own steam. And if they can't do it, it it'll never happen. Uh, so that's one kind of that's one kind of bad teaching. The other kind of bad teaching is uh, 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 variant variant of that is, is procedural. Is to just teach procedurally. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather than teaching the underlying principles, and formula and teaching the students to formulate the procedures um, as they go, and uh, you know the, the the essence of uh, uh, the essence of engineering is that the discussion always starts with what are the properties of the solution, and then the next question is how do we get there from where we are now, uh, because there are always multiple solutions to the problem in engineering. Well, I'm interested um, in your thoughts on where is critical thinking being taught today, um, because it seems to be a huge lack in our culture in general. Yeah, well, the answer is it's not being taught well in very many places. Um, there are examples, but they're isolated examples. Uh, certain portions of the military has really bought into this. Mm. Uh, uh, they funded <clears throat> the, a lot of the original research on this was funded by the Navy, interestingly enough. Wow. And... Um, uh, the uh, uh, and it's training not just of uh, leaders, not just of commanders, but again, it's training of every every soldier uh, or or sailor or whatever, all the way down because they have to think that way because the systems they're dealing that they use the, the weapon systems they use are so highly automated now that um, they don't have to worry about you know what they have to worry about are the why questions and they don't have to worry about the how questions. The machine will run itself. Um, the um, uh, uh, so military portions of the military have invest, uh, have learned this very well. Uh, portions of uh, certain medical specialties have really bought into this well, uh, and some have not. It's quite interesting. Uh, uh, I've done a fair amount. I started out. I, I spent some time on the faculty of a medical school and 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 learned learned that one the hard way, uh, but. Uh, uh, some 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 specialties have really bought into this well. Um, uh, as I say, commercial pilot training generally has not, because uh, uh, the people in charge of commercial pilot training, both at the FAA and at the airlines, were trained before, were trained back in the 1960s and 70s before the changes in philosophy took place in the military. Um, 
and uh, they haven't changed their thinking yet. And there are lots of examples, lots and lots of examples of pilots flying planes into the ground because they were following procedures. Yeah. And and I find that this, uh, a lot of what you're talking about uh, parallels um, diagnostic uh, or troubleshooting for technicians. Um, Absolutely. Like, Troubleshoot, you know, it, troubleshoot. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, uh, it's just right in sync with what we found worked best, which was to get them to understand the structure and get to understand how these different systems all interrelated and so that they had a, a, a certain level of, of knowledge, of domain knowledge of how the vehicle worked, how the different systems in the vehicle worked. And then, and then you get to start feeding them uh, either solve problems or assign them to check out a vehicle and, and, uh, and, yeah. and report back what they found. Please don't fix it. It took me a while to break it, so don't fix it. But, but you, you definitely <laughs> yeah. get... You definitely get them uh, in a situation where uh, they have they have learned some procedures, they have learned some knowledge, and they have a a structure, if you will, for thinking about thinking through the problem. And then, you know, let them loose and see what they do. And if they flounder a little bit, come over, give them some coaching, and 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 keep them moving forward. Uh, yeah, but, uh, very interesting. There's a lot of research done on troubleshooting because uh, that was what the Navy paid for. Yes. And, uh, the, um, uh, uh, and, and it's fascinating. The domain knowledge for troubleshooting consists of a number of things. You have to know how the system works. Yep. You have to know how the system works when it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. In other words, what are the yep. failure modes of every component? Yep. And what are the probabilities associated with each failure mode? Right. And, and then you have to be able to model the malfunctioning of the system if it has that particular component failure. And, uh, and, oh, by the way, you have to do this at the right level of resolution. Uh, if you're working at the circuit board level, then you don't teach them component failures. You teach them circuit board failures yeah. uh, and the like. Um, so, so you do that. But then there are other things that they know, too. They also know test procedures, and those are, that is procedural learning. And they know the cost. Uh, they know the cost of the procedure, the test, and they know the cost of, of the part or the, uh, the replacement they're going to do and so on. And what's fascinating is that a novice troubleshooter will, who doesn't have these skills and doesn't have that domain knowledge, yeah. will, um, will collect a lot more information yep. than an expert. An expert yep. will look at it and say, hmm, okay, yep. it's either this or this or this. Right. And then they will go and they will select the one test that will give them the most information right. to separate out those three hypotheses or three to five hypotheses. And by the way, that's the number, three to five um, hypotheses. Um, uh, and uh, that will give them the most piece of uh, and, and, can, and, and tell them which one it is. Yeah. And after one or two tests, they know. Yeah. Same thing is true in medicine. Yeah. That's troubleshooting, med you know, med that's troubleshooting too. <laughs> yeah, true, uh, true. And so on. Yeah. I happen to have a good, I happen to have a good friend who is a, uh, uh, a master airframe and engine mechanic for American Airlines. He knows how to fix anything about any plane that American Airlines flies. Very, very, very highly trained guy. Yep. I love talking to him about his work. Sure. sure. And you can see all those, you know, I, you know yep. because I can see all of those types of, of knowledge that yep. he's invoking all the time. Yep. And uh, you know, he's been at, he's been at the job for twenty odd years now, more than twenty years, uh, and so on. So he can you know he can do all kinds of things. So I asked, what do you do at work? Well, he works at night. Most mechanics work at night on air, airlines. He works at night, and what he does is he sp um, he spends most of the time or a good lot of his time on the phone to other mechanics mm -hmm. somewhere else in the world. Oh yeah, yeah. Who want to talk to him? I said, yep. well, how many people does American Airlines have that are at your level of expertise? American Airlines, worldwide, right? <laughs> the answer is answer. Uh, yeah, about twenty-five. Yeah, throughout the All world. Of the yeah. throughout the world. <laughs> yeah, right. That's it. And the answer is they're on the phone talking to each other all the time. Oh yeah, they're sharing that knowledge because you know every problem is an opportunity to learn something new. And if you're in a in the right culture, and I would say that American Airlines has that culture, you're sharing that information with your colleagues all the time because. When a plane goes down, it's not a couple of bucks. 
it's it's tens of thousands of dollars per hour for that machine. Uh, Absolutely correct. To stop to stop flying yeah. and uh, so they're you know they're under tremendous pressure to fix it right now <laughs> or better yeah. yet avoid avoid uh, it breaking in the first place by preventive maintenance and and uh, that sort of thing but yeah well, there's more to it there's more to it than that he's, oh that's true he's a, that's he, true. He's, he's he's very critical of the uh, you know today you know the, the modern airplanes today the recently designed ones are data networks with engines attached yeah true. and yeah. uh they uh, and so Boeing and Airbus have taken the position that oh you can just troubleshoot anything on the uh, uh, by going to the uh, maintenance bay and 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 going through the maintenance routines in the flight computer. Mm-hmm. Well, the answer is not exactly. Yeah. And he hates those things. Yeah. He would rather troubleshoot the problem himself because he can do it better than the computer can. Right. Yes. Yeah. He has that and deep knowledge to do that. Yes. He, he has the deep knowledge exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and oh by the way, and if he's dealing with an outlier case that isn't covered by the computer. Then yeah. that's a separate uh, that's a separate issue. Yep. Oh, one and other and oh, and, and one, one other one other war story goes back to the Lufthansa example. Um, so that course that I was that I was involved in building cost had that project had a budget of around four million dollars, yeah. and um, uh, so it was not cheap. Uh, they uh, 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 one of the things uh, that, uh, that that we noted. When, you know, again, uh, you know, one of the final fundamental flaws was once again they were teaching the systems, but they weren't teaching the interactions between the systems. Yeah. The interactions between the systems are what the flight computers do, and uh, the uh, uh, and the problems that you solve, uh, uh, the problems that the students were having so much trouble solving, were the ones that involved interaction in more than one system, yeah. which is done through the flight computer, yeah. and. Um, so they tracked, they, they looked at one statistic and the statistic was number of flight computers returned to depot with no trouble found. Because the first thing that would happen is that the student would, or you know, a, new, a new maintenance mechanic would pull out the flight computer and, and send it back saying it's broke. Yeah. And the answer is no, it wasn't broke. Yeah, right, uh, it, they missed something. Uh, and yeah. They missed something. And uh, the uh, uh, and, and those things, by the way, are not cheap. They're over a hundred. They were there in 1980 money. They were over a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars a piece. Yeah. The um, uh, anyway, uh, uh, and the answer was there was a dramatic decline in the number of uh, in the number of returns from the people that had been through this new training. Good. And that saving alone was enough to pay back the entire cost of development of the course over a period of three years. Wow. Again, it's a it's a very expensive industry. Um, we are um, flying along here at 105, and uh, I hate to say it, but we have to cut this off. Um, we need to get you back again and and, uh, and do some more with this yeah. topic and this some others. Absolutely uh, fantastic, Rob. There was one more question. I was going to say, if, are there any key references or resources? You know a couple of things that we can include when we send up the final email to folks. I mean, yeah, you first, and then if there's anything else you would recommend as other reading or, or critical mm-hmm. things yeah. that you could send out. That would be um, um, Yeah. Um, or you could email it to us. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. let me, let me email, yeah. let me email yeah. that to you because I've yeah. got some things that are that do this- it right, things that do it wrong. Unfortunately, uh, the one with the best title is uh, Ruth Clark's book on expertise, and it turns out not that this isn't what she's talking about. Okay. Uh, uh, so it's 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 not it's not on topic for this. Okay. Well, this one thing I want to mention here, as we uh, as we adjourn, is uh, I've been reading the book Noise uh, in hardcover recently, and it is mm-hmm. um, right up our alley here in terms of uh, judgment, uh, decision making, uh, appraisal of things. And the difficulty with doing that because of biases and uh, and other problems. But um, uh, have a look at that for those of you that are on here, and um, you may find it uh, interesting. It-